So let's start with the MCQ marathon and uh, the principle on which I have developed this MCQ marathon is that we revise the important things in orthopedics and then we we complete the entire ortho so that you are able to do and finish everything in this one hour. So I'll not keep it for more than one hour. And in this one hour, we will do all the important images, all the key points and all the questions. We've always been saying revise last three years. So I have kept last three years for you to do. Going through the first topic, orthopedics means straight child. This term was coined by Nicholas Henry, who's called as the father of orthopedics. If you, if you go to this uh, Thomas, a very, very important scientist, he's called as the British father of orthopedics. And Robert Jones, who's nephew of Thomas, is called as a modern father. John Lace has been labeled as the father of arthroplasty. So these are the important scientists and their names that we must remember. These are the questions that come everywhere, whether it's NEET, INICT, or FMG exams, they are uniform. There is no difference. Then I go to the next topic. If you look at the first investigation that you usually do in orthopedics, it is x-rays. And uh, the x-rays can show you the bones right in the center, which has got a marrow and the cortex. The marrow is an area where majority of the diseases will occur. And then you have the soft tissues, which are called as the muscles, the fascia, and then the fat and the skin. What you need to understand is inside this, inside this, uh, this fascia, right, is the compartments. And uh, that's what you need to remove uh, the fascia when you're doing a fasciotomy so that the compartments are relieved. And remember, x-rays are usually the first investigation. And they are also uh, the investigation which can show you the soft tissue. It's not only the bones, it's also the soft tissue. So x-rays are shown and you have to pick up the investigation. Nowadays, this is one of the very common disease which you will see in the world that's called as osteoarthritis. So this is the patella right in the center. This is the femur, this is the tibia, this is the joint space. Joint space is basically a space occupied by cartilage. X-rays can show you the bone, can show you the soft tissues, but can't show you the cartilage. And when there is reduction in the joint space, it means this is arthritis. There is destruction, destruction in the cartilage. That's arthritis. And this is one of the commonest arthritis in the world, osteoarthritis. So this is a normal knee x-ray. Going to the shoulder, remember, this is the coracoid. They just love to ask you about the coracoid. This is the glenoid. This is the head of the humerus. This is the clavicle. This is the acromion. So highest bony landmark is the lateral end of clavicle that you see on an AP X-ray of the shoulder. And when I look at uh, the elbow, this is the radial head, and this is the capitulum. Many a time they will point an arrow to this bone and ask you, which is this center? This is capitulum, it is the first center around the elbow which ossifies. Extremely important point for everybody to remember who's appearing for the exam. In the wrist, they somehow love this bone, which is board shaped bone called a scaphoid, which is sleeping on the lower end of radius. This moon-shaped bone called as a lunate, and that's the largest carpal bone called as a capitate. So around shoulder is coracoid, around elbow is capitulum, around the wrist is capitate, the largest carpal bone. And this is the moon, the moon-shaped bone on the lateral view lunate. This is extremely important. They pointed, they just love to point on these bones. Around the pelvis, an area for us to remember the sacroiliac area. It is the sacroiliitis or the inflammation of this area, which is known in a disease called as ankylosing spondylitis. Low backache, morning stiffness, sacroiliitis. And uh, Going further, that's how it will look like inflamed, classical. 
and it's all white you know sacral lattice is all white the entire skeleton appears white and that's what you should remember and uh, then the arches this this is an arch which you see at the at the upper end of femur and the pelvis that's the continuity of the joint along with the pelvis and the femur and if this arch is broken this is a broken shenton's arch which is a characteristic point of a dislocation of the hip or a fracture of the upper end and ct scan will show you a calcified tissue m for mri m for marrow m for mri m for muscular tissues m for mri it will show you everything it will show you the disc it will show you the bone marrow it will show you the soft tissues the neural tissue so mri is practically showing you everything except the 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 cortex or the calcification in a high quality mri is also going to show you the the disc which is a cartilage and if you look at let's assume this is lumbar vertebra 4 this is lumbar vertebra 5 this is a disc which is between l4 and l5 and the rule of a disc is whenever there's a disc prolapse like between l4 and l5 the commonest nerve root affected is l5 and that's if you remember that you will always be very very uh, comfortable remembering it and uh, just the sagittal view of the knee mris many a time they will show you that which is a ligament so remember if you look at the tibia the acl inserts anteriorly into tibia and in tibia the pcl is posterior to the tibia in femur both come from the posterior area and uh, one more very crucial thing that one must remember that is that the acl restricts hyper extension and internal rotation now this is something which is being very commonly asked to you guys and pcl the posterior element restricts the external rotation it restricts the external rotation the acl and the pcl they make a criss cross that's called as a cruciate that's why anterior and the posterior cruciate ligaments one of a very very prime thing that one should remember and remember ct is white and marrow is going to show you everything except the white structure the calcification and the and the cortical structures and uh, when you look at the x rays they've been showing you different periosteal reaction narrow zone is a benign disease limited periosteal reaction wide zone is wide spread periosteal reaction so this is a solid periosteal reaction right anybody who can tell me the solid periosteal reaction of a benign zone or the narrow zone where will you see that anybody the 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 single layer one is a benign uh, benign tumor and uh, any other place where you can see dr sunil dr saurav where do you see a single layer of thick periosteal reaction classical called as a narrow zone yeah it's benign right right parameter it's benign but which disease no it's not even the nostril so single layer can be in the benign diseases but classically in osteomyelitis and shalu is the first one to answer that fantastic dr shalu it is osteomyelitis day 7 to day 10 you will see a single layer whereas a uh, wide zone is like the rays of a sun coming out or a triangle underneath the periosteum called the cordman's triangle or multiple layers above the bone called as an onion peel reaction now these can be seen in any malignant lesion they are not specific but if i have to pick up the common ones the sun ray appearance anybody sun ray appearance very good dr pankuri it is osteosarcoma brilliant sun ray appearance is classical for uh, classically they describe for osteosarcoma it can be any malignant tumor but classical for osteosarcoma similarly cordman's triangle again the same very nice very very nice brilliant brilliant dr prince it's again osteosarcoma dr p k sani fantastic it's osteosarcoma and then onion peel anybody onion peel multiple layers coming outside on the bone anybody onion peel appearance anybody who can tell me the onion peel appearance
I'm waiting for the first answer for onion peel appearance to come to me. Look, anything can be seen in malignant tumors, but classical onion peel, fantastic Dr. Yogesh, it's Ewing sarcoma. Harsha, you are correct, Ewing's. Gulshan, you are correct, Ewing's. So onion peel is Ewing's, that's how you remember. And just to summarize, sunray appearance or Codman's triangle osteosarcoma, but can be seen in any malignant lesion. Onion peel is seen in, again, any malignant lesion, but classically in Ewing's or chronic osteomyelitis. Soap bubble appearances, GCT versus edumentinoma. Patchy calcification. Calcifications are more commonly seen into the cartilaginous tumors where you will have rings and arcs and chondrosarcoma more than chondroblastoma. And the homogeneous uniform calcification is in osteosarcoma. This is the cartilaginous tumors, mortal calcification, homogeneous calcification of osteosarcoma. And this is what, remember this, my friends, the joint goes till the joint. The tumor of the lower end radius still proved otherwise the GCT. This is the only tumor which can involve the joints as written in Robin's textbook of pathology. And this is a classical image that came in NEET 2021, this September. And this is something that's always going to be there. Remember, if you miss it out, there is no forgiving. This is something one, one should be answering even if he's sleeping. That's the point I want you to tell. Neen may be koi utha ke puche to is cancer, giant cell tumor nikalna chahiye. And then that MCQs, identify the label structure. French, we did that, this is capital M. This is L4, L5 disc prolapse. This is L4. We have done this. L5, this is a disc prolapse. The most common nerve root compressed is L5. This is uh, very, very uh, important. And uh, and fan, then you must remember X phase of the first investigation can show everything except the cartilage, CT, calcification, and cortex. But the most of the things are picked up on MRI. For multiple metastasis, PET scan is more important than bone scan, but bone scan is good for osteoblastic metastasis like prostate. This is area one. One of the most important area where you will get an image like L4, L5 disc prolapse, came in INIC, T, NEAT, PG, and GCT. They are going to show you these images which you should remember. Chronic osteomyelitis is the commonest image as in infections. They will show you a dead bone in the center of a cavity called as a sequestrum surrounding sclerotic bone called as involucrum. And then you have the draining sinuses called as a cloaca. Pathognomic is a sequestrum. They can give you a history. A child has pus discharge and bony spicules come out. What are those spicules? The sequestrum or the dead bone. Remember that. It's a deformed sclerose bone. The dead bones are usually white. Right, so they are usually the white. And remember, yes, sort of you're right. Most common things are asked most commonly. So there's no need to remember the rare things. Osteomyelitis is the number one image that's usually asked. And then uh, this is negative pressure wound therapy, which is usually put to cover any wound over a bone because the white tissue should be covered and bone is such a white tissue. So you remove, the, debride it, and then negative pressure wound therapy, vacuum assisted closure, which is usually done as a portable device taken up by the plastic surgeons, they give it to the patient. The most common infection of hand is the infection of the nail bed called as peronychia felon or vitlo is the infection of pulse space. Most of them are usually due to staph aureus. And looking at the questions, a 10 year old boy with progressive swelling of six months of the upper tibia, if you have a swelling which is sclerose margin on tibia, think about subacute osteomyelitis also called as a Brody's abscess. Remember that the options here are very varied and uh, tenosynovitis of the flexed in a sheath, the affected finger, which of the following is correct. So affected finger will be flexed because in tenosynovitis of the flexor sheath, you will have flexion of the fingers. You will have tenderness along the sheath. Patients will present with severe pain. It can be surgically managed as the answer. Usually it's non-operative, but out of them, this is correct. 12 year old male complains of swelling of the lower rim of reactive bone. Again, the same thing. There is a sclerosed margin. And whenever a sclerosed margin is there, it means it's a slow grumbling process. It's subacute osteomyelitis. And the name for that is Brody's abscess. If you ask you, is Brody's subacute or chronic? So answer is Brody's is subacute more than chronic. This is something 
which should be into your tips. This is something very crucial. Ring sequestrum is a sequestrum which is at the infections at the pinhole of an external fixator. This also can be seen sometimes over the terminal ends of amputation. A young girl has a thigh swelling with discharging sinus from the bony fragments came. The parents were concerned. What was the fragment this was sequestrum? They're talking about chronic osteomyelitis. This is the infection of the terminal pulp space of the finger called as a felon or a whitlow. And remember, in felon or whitlow, it's not staph epidermidis, it's staph aureus, which is the number one uh, cause. And if not treated, they can cause the tenosynovitis or osteomyelitis. So remember, osteomyelitis is the first investigation that you do is x-rays. But the one which will show you the changes earliest is an MRI. Osteomyelitis is hematogenous, involves the metaphyses usually in staph or is the commonest affected uh, the organism. And in sickle cell, remember, it's salmonella. But in sickle cell also, remember, it's usually the diaphyses that's involved. And uh, then when we talk about... Uh, Chronic osteomyelitis, dead bone is diagnostic. And if you remove that, you will see a bleeding surface called the paprika sign. Multifocal osteomyelitis means osteomyelitis involving multiple bones. One of the synonymous terms is a SAFO syndrome. And also in sickle cell anemia, you will have multifocal osteomyelitis. Peronemia is the infection of the nail bed. Felon or vitlo infection of pulse space. These two terms are almost asked everywhere. TB of the spine, if you look at uh, the, it involves two contiguous vertebras together. It usually does not involve one. And, uh, and, and then the rarest involved is the facet joint and the spinous process. And uh, tuberculosis of the hip joint, the number one affected area is the acetabulum, then the femoral head. And in the femoral head is a triangular area, which is called the Babcock's triangle, which is very commonly affected. And uh, this Babcock's triangle is an area, probably because of monocyte macrophage deficiency. That's the area. And sometimes in hip disorders, they have to replace a joint. And the replacements can be with a layer of cement, which is also called as polymethyl met acrylate, PMMA. Or sometimes you can have uncemented replacements. Remember, Uncemented replacements are costlier. And remember that uncemented replacements are having a longer shelf life. And uh, then looking at the questions, which is the commonest affected area? So the answer is acetabulum, already spoken about. And uh, surgery, including biopsy, is indicating TB spine. Forget about TB spine. Everywhere the biopsy is done in, or the operative intervention is done in spine, if there is bowel, bladder, involvement. So if a patient comes to you and he says there is bowel bladder involvement, right? The urinary control is gone. You will operate it. If the patient comes and says that he's worsening the control, he's loosening. You will have to operate it. And if there is no improvement, no improvement can be if you do not know the diagnosis. No improvement can be if the compression is worsening or the drugs or the conservative management is not working. So there are three indications here where you have uh, to operate a spine. The number one indication is uh, bowel bladder involvement. So this is required. Number two is when you don't know the diagnosis of the drugs are not working, required. Or you have worsening or you have uh, no improvement. So that is the cause. But cold abscess without neurological compromise is not an indication to operate a disease of spine. So remember that. And uh, remember, the tuberculosis affects the S H. Okay, spine, then hip, then knee. As you go up from down to up, it always involves the two vertebra. As the neural deficit will set in, it will first be a motor loss, then a sensory loss, and the last is bowel bladder involvement. And I told you, when the bowel and bladder are involved, you have to go for the operative intervention. 
the earliest clinical the radiological sign is loss of curvature of spine in the hip because of more vascularity there will be osteopenia around the joint and the treatment of the tuberculosis of spine is ATT anti tubercular therapy and plus surgery when indicated and the indication of surgeries it's uh, already been uh, discussed with you remember in tuberculosis of the hip you have flexion abduction external rotation so there is is a case where you have increase in the length and this is the early stage where you have synovitis stage 1 as the joint will be worsening out as the joint will be keep on da damaging you will have flexion adduction internal rotation which is seen in arthritis and in the last there will be a destruction of the entire joint and the femoral head will go from one area of the acetabulum to other it should be called as a wandering femoral head but it's called as a wandering acetabulum tuberculosis of spine if you treat it well with the drugs there will be fusion of the one vertebra with the other called as bony ankylosis and tuberculosis of the hip the peripheral joints there will be a fusion leading on to fibrous ankylosis and uh, bone tumors remember the most common area where the tumors occurs or the infections occur is the metaphyses and in the metaphyses one of the commonest tumor you must remember is osteosarcoma in the middle of a bone remember two osteoid osteoma remember the second one adamantinoma these are two relatively less aggressive tumors and then you have a very aggressive tumor of the bone one of the most aggressive tumors of the bone the ewing sarcoma and the bony ends remember chondroblastoma more than the giant cell tumor but usually for mcqs they just love to ask you uh, the gct as the commonest so uh, the the ends of a bone is epiphyses and metaphyses or the growth plate the physis but uh, the middle part of the bone is a diaphysis so remember that this is extremely uh, extremely important and uh, and also uh, remember that uh, one of the commonest uh, location wise tumor that they ask you is gct i don't know why but these examiners they are just in love with giant cell tumor and which uh, it's, it's it's almost a universal question and they will usually ask you the giant cell tumor of of the the lower end of radius right that's a very very common thing that they will ask you and uh, if you look at the benign tumors you will have a single cyst single cavity cyst with a bony fragment inside called as a fallen leaf sign called as unicameral or the simple bone cyst they will usually give you the upper end of humerus if they ask you uh, yeah good question uh, professor osteoclastoma or giant cell tumor prefer giant cell tumor there was a question which was asked so it's better to answer giant cell tumor thank you very much for uh, this question and then um, coming to uh, the metaphyseal area where you have multiple segments multiloculated cyst which is towards one corner this is aneurysmal bone cyst and uh, unicameral bone cyst is a single cavity cyst but aneurysmal bone cyst has got multiple segments inside it and uh, if you look at the end of a bone in a relatively skeletally immature individual it's a cordomens tumor but it doesn't go to the joint the joint is giant cell tumor so cordomens tumor is a purely epiphyseal tumor because giant cell tumor is an epiphyseal metaphyseal tumor right so assume that if there was a gct it will go right till the metaphyse it will be huge going till the joint gct and it will be skeletally mature the joint would have fused whereas cordomens tumor or chondroblastoma as they call it it's a calcified tumor because it's cartilaginous it will be in the epiphyses only and uh, a bony growth which is a developmental abnormality is called as osteo there is a cartilage cover over it which you can't see on x rays so it's large to feel you will feel the bone and the cartilage cap 
small on x-rays because the cartilage are not seen on x-rays. So these are called as the osteochondromas or exostosis, right? And uh, they can be, they can have the stalks or they can be pedunculated without sessile without a stalk. So pedunculated or sessile, that's how they, they are. Osteoid osteoma, it is a thickening of the diaphyseal area of the, of the, of the bone. And uh, this is classical having night pain relieved on taking salicylates. A very good question. How do you differentiate ABC and GCT? So let's, let's, let's go to this image in the back which, which, which talks about the ABC. And uh, let's assume that this is a bone of the upper intibia. So in ABC, it's skeletally immature. Whereas in GCT is mature and it will be towards the end of the bone going right like this. So it is epiphyseal and after maturity, whereas ABC is metaphyseal before maturity. So that's how uh, they are they are compared side by side. Friends, uh, N. chondroma, most common tumor of bones of hand and feet. There are high allele cartilage into this on biopsy. And it's it's one of the very commonly asked tumors. There's Ollier syndrome, where you have multiple N. chondromas. Multiple or Mafusi syndrome, where you have hemangiomas, you have calcified uh, superficial veins called as flebolites, and you have multiple N chondromas. So M for Mafusi, M for many things. All right, so this is how uh, you must remember. So you have hemangiomas. Level it's an enchondromas, whereas all yours is only multiple uh, enchondromas. And um, most common tumor of hand is SCC, Professor. Most common tumor of bones of hand and feet is enchondroma. Remember that. So, this is a twist that they ask you. Flebolites, right? Flebolites are calcified superficial veins. And remember this image going till the end in the lower end radius, GCT, going till the top of the upper end tibia, GCT, going to the top of the upper end femur, giant cell tumor. Classical three images asked in exams about GCT, the number one asked image in the exam. The upper end femur, if it looks like a stick, it's called as a shepherd crook deformity, seen in a disease which is fibrous dysplasia, which is a pre-malignant condition. It's again a developmental malformation, but there's expansion of the bones. Vertical striations in the bone are seen in hemangiomas. Remember that. It's also called a jail bar pattern. On the CT scan in this, you have the polka dot sign. Polka dot sign is seen in the CT scan in cases of hemangiomas, a very commonly asked question. Osteosarcoma is a bone forming tumor. Uniform calcification is seen. Punched out lytic lesions are seen in uh, multiple myeloma, but friends, bewelled lytic lesions are features of eosinophilic granuloma, permeative large, large lytic lesions are again feature of Langerhans cell histiocytosis. And salt pepper, although not lytic, but salt pepper skull is seen in hyperparathyroidism bone resorption. That's how you are able to pick it. But number one asked is multiple myeloma punched out lytic lesions. And uh, if you look at the skull, this, this skull, which has got cotton wool like appearance, it is seen in Pagets. Pagets is an osteoclast defect. And uh, you have a disease where you have increasing hat size. That's Pagets. Very, very, uh, very, very important. And Prem Kishorji, I can see all the messages that you're writing. And uh, so let's have a look at the, 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 the questions now. This is GCT, already discussed multiple times. This is ABC, so treated by extended curettage and bone grafting. 
30 presence with swelling on the knee joint. Biopsy has mononuclear and joint cells. What's your diagnosis? My diagnosis is osteoclastoma. And uh, remember, the mononuclear cells are the malignant cells in a GCT. And uh, again, this is how the GCT going till the upper end of tibia will present. And uh, again, the GCT of the lower end uh, of femur and chemotherapy is not the mainstay of treatment. So this is the answer here. So it is epiphysial, metaphysial, eccentric, defined margin, but chemotherapy is not. 70-year-old male has single well-defined light lesion, has no other complaint, urinary emission, no abnormality. What the diagnosis? Histiocytosis. Remember, if the urine is normal, no other complaint, you will not think about any other diagnosis. Histiocytosis is very common. And uh, similarly, histiocytosis is very common if they give you a light lesion in any child which has a grooved nucleus, the cells with a grooved nucleus, eosinophilic cytoplasm and fibroblastic proliferation. X-ray is shown below. So this is Langerhans cell histocytosis. They're somehow like GCT and Langerhans cell histocytosis a lot. Most radiosensitive tumor is Ewing's, but remember chemotherapy and surgery is the mainstay of treatment of Ewing's. So although Ewing's uh, is the most radiosensitive bone tumor, but chemo and surgery are very, very important in this condition. And if you look at the sun reappearance, I'll pick up osteosarcoma, no doubt about it. Tumors and infection, whatever the radiology says, biopsy is a gold standard. Sun reappearance, cordmist triangle, onion peel, they're all for malignant lesions. Benign will have well-defined margins, uniform consistency. Malignant will have ill-defined margins and variable consistency. Remember that single central cavity with this fragment at the bottom is a unicambial bone cyst. Multiloculated eccentric is an aneurysmal bone cyst. Night pain relieved on taking salicylates is osteoarostoma. Large to feel small and x rays is a bone covered by cartilage osteochondroma. Epiphyseal lesion with calcification is chondroblastoma, the cordman's tumor. Most common tumor of bones of hand and feet is enchondroma. Light lesion that goes right till the joint is GCT. First decayed onion peel appearance with diaphysis evings. Although the commonest age where you see evings is second decade. Second decade with metaphysis with cordman's triangle, sun reappearance is osteosarcoma, and it peaks in the second decade. Metastases are seen in from breast, prostate, and then lung, and most commonly in the spine. And uh, skull, you have punched out lesions of multiple myeloma. Nerves, they just love. Remember some sensory distributions around the shoulder in the in the regimental area is an axillary nerve. If you if you uh, look at the sensations, right, and um, around the shoulder, the nerve that's damaged is the axillary nerve. Around the the humerus is the radial nerve. More so in the lower part of humerus, that's called the Halston Lewis sign. And um, in the elbow dislocation behind the medial epicondyle is the ulnar nerve. At the head of radius is the posterior interosseous nerve. Remember the sensory supply over the lateral side of the forearm is by the musculocutaneous nerve, which is the safe nerve supplying the coracobrachialis, brachialis, and biceps. So supination and flexion of the elbow is affected. And then uh, in the hand, you have uh, the first web space on the dorsum is supplied by the radial nerve. The tip of the index finger is supplied by the by the median nerve and the tip of the little finger is by the ulnar nerve. So these are the important nerves. You should remember the first lumbricals, the, there are four lumbricals. The first two lumbricals are supplied by the median nerve. The other two lumbricals are supplied by the ulnar nerve. The action of the lumbricals is they make an L in your hand. L for lumbricals. And uh, if the lumbricals are paralyzed, you will end up having a claw hand and, and this claw hand can be taken care by the knuckle bender splint. So knuckle bender splint. So this is the for the lumbricals. And uh, when you look at the interosei, the interosei are able to, um, dorsal interosei will do abduction. So they are doing abduction, right? So that is, uh, the Igawa test, the Palmer introsia, they, they will hold a card between the finger called as a card test. And uh, the, the adductor pollicis, one of the muscles supplied by um, the ulnar nerve will hold a book between the thumb and the palm. 
this is called as a book test and if your um, your adductor pollicis or ulnar nerve is paralyzed you will flex the thumb and hold the hold the book that is called as a from and sign so from and sign and the book test are for ulnar nerve as compared to it in the median nerve remember if you make a fist and the median nerve is paralyzed your fingers will stand out this is pointing index and if you keep a pen over the palm and ask the patient to touch it this is the pen test which came in this uh, this very neat september 2021 and uh, the branch of the median nerve the the, the anterior interosseous nerve will this do this okay sign also called as kilo nevin sign because anterior interosseous nerve supplies the flexor pollicis longus and fdp lateral half so that's how it will do this is extremely extremely important anterior interosseous nerve and uh, then the claw hand this is classical image you should be able to pick it up and knuckle bender splint is ulnar nerve more than median nerve and if your c5 and c6 nerve roots are involved that's called as a Erb's palsy, Veta's slip deformity. The arm is adducted. There is pronation, and there is no external rotation. Very, very, very important. And um, this is a test for carpal tunnel syndrome, called as a Fallon's test in carpal tunnel syndrome. Which nerve is involved? MK. Which nerve is involved in carpal tunnel syndrome? Saurav. Which nerve is involved in carpal tunnel syndrome? The median nerve. and uh, this is called as a fallon's test and uh, also remember that there is something called as a durkan's direct compression test into the carpal tunnel area which is the which is the the, the most specific test for the carpal tunnel and remember that wrist drop is a feature of radial nerve palsy commonly seen in fracture humerus and this is a wrist drop opposite to it is a cock up splint that is given to the patient Ruse test or Atkins test or Wright's test—they are all the tests for the thoracic outlet syndrome. So they are all the tests for thoracic outlet syndrome. They just love it. And Allen's test is for patency of the radial and the ulnar artery to see. if the circulation is proper or not so this is a pen test for median nerve abductor pollicis brevis this is a multiple humeral fractures following which he has flexion of elbow is difficult supination of forearm and the complaints of loss of sensation on lateral side of forearm musculocutaneous nerve this is supplied by radial nerve as commonly explained to you identify the nerve supply of the marked muscle median nerve they have marked the first lumbrical as already discussed to you foot drop is due to the common peroneal nerve injury around the neck of fibula that's an area where it's very very close to the bone so has chances to get damaged and the most specific test for carpal tunnel is durkan's test and this is a cock up splint which has been already been discussed to you and uh, in this you can see that the glenoid is there but the head is down so there is a dislocation and dislocations of the shoulder the nerve is axillary which is damaged remember cock up splint for radial nerve knuckle bender for ulnar more than median figure of eight bended for clavicle we'll talk in trauma dunlop or smith traction for supracondylar humerus if you have a nerve injury and it's neuropraxia it will recover if it is not recovering it's not neuropraxia axonot messes is a partial recovery tunnel sign is positive plus progressive so tunnel sign tells about the speed of nerve regeneration and if the nerve recovers at the rate of 1 mm per day it is an average speed of regeneration and neurotmes is is a tunnel sign positive but static it means the nerve is not recovering for any nerve recovery emg is the best median nerve is sensory specific for index ulnar nerve for little radial nerve for west space and the radial nerve is the most commonly damaged nerve in the erb's palsy c5 c6 is involved there is loss of shoulder abduction and elbow flexion plum case c8 t1 there will be a claw hand remember erb's is the commonest brachial plexus palsy erb's also has the best prognosis prep ladder app is not available on ios the mails are being written do not worry my friend rakesh sir it will be very very soon uploaded so 
we are working day in day out for you people right so we will try to get it message read and answer given rakesh sir all three times the answer stays the same we are working on it lumbricals action it makes an l paralysis claw hand knuckle bender splint thoracic outlet syndrome atson writes and do test and allen's test is the potency of the radial and ulnar nerve remember my friends when you look at trauma mallet finger is an avulsion of extensor tendon from the distal phalanx it is treated by a splint jersey finger is a version of flexor digitorum profundus it is treated by surgeries when you have a shoulder dislocation there is a loss of contour if this is the glenoid the head is below the joint it is down and the arm is abducted it's out anterior dislocation the nerve damages axillary nerve which is very common carrying angle is an angle between the arm and the forearm reduced angle is cubitus varus seen in malunion of supracondylar humerus and increase is cubitus valgus seen in non union of lateral condyle of humerus very very important this is extremely extremely important area montagia again a very common question fracture of ulna upper third with dislocation of the radial head and the commonest type is type 1 when the radial head goes up the classification is a bedos classification for montagia my friends it's a very commonly asked image kelyazi which is a more common fracture also very commonly asked fracture of the lower part of radius with disruption of the distal radial nerve joint with damage to the interosseous membrane along with the damage to the triangular fibro cartilage complex around the wrist joint and then you have a fracture of um, the lower end of radius if it goes posterior or dorsal it is called as posterior displacement of the extra articular fracture priyanka chopra posterior scolis and if the fracture fragment goes anterior anterior means towards the thumb thumb is always anterior so the displacement is anterior so anterior is smith so posterior will have uh, will have the the deformity which is like a dinner folk deformity and the anterior displacement will have uh, something called as a uh, the the garden spade deformity so this is a dinner folk deformity of colies and garden spade of smith so the most common fracture that occurs um, in a young postmenopausal in, in a postmenopausal female the fall on the wrist uh, will be a colies with dorsal displacement extra articular fractures where smith will be if the the wrist is flexed in that uh, in that situation the blood supply of scaphoid is distal to proximal so in the fractures it is the proximal pole that undergoes a vascular necrosis or non union so this is a scaphoid fracture comes as an image many times wide bone is dead this is a vascular necrosis of the scaphoid my friends bennets is an intraarticular fracture of the base of first metacarpal with a dislocation rolando is only a fracture of the base without a dislocation very important if you look at the the wrist dislocation the lateral view if the lunate comes out it's a lunate dislocation if the lunate stays in everything else comes out it's perilunate perilunate is more common than lunate and the median nerve is most commonly involved in either of them looking at the mcqs scaphoid is proximal one third most common she had a history of fall in the bathroom with a dorsal displacement this is extra articular fracture with a dorsal displacement montagia is a proximal third of ulna fracture with a radial head dislocation caused by the fall on ground with a flex wrist i already told you the smith fracture this is a classical image for a galiazi fracture and again the question is the same fall on bathroom post menopausal colies and uh, they have asked you a fracture olecranon how will you treat it i will do an open reduction with tension band wiring because it's an open injury it's an it's an intraarticular fracture patient has a supracondylar fracture what you will do next i it's it's in it's a fracture which is suspected so reduction is out reduction is out compare with the x ray of the left hand is not there so you will do a cast oblique a slab which is a better 
thing to do in the initial stages. That's how you go. Shoulder is the most common joint to dislocate. It goes anteriorly. Remember that the head is to glenoid ratio is four is to one. That's why it's a large head on a flat dish and um, head will go down and out and uh, hip and shoulder the same. The head is down and out. And in uh, the test, the Dugas test is inability to touch the tip of opposite shoulder. And other tests are Callaway's and Hamilton ruler. The, the method of rejection most commonly is Scorcher, Stimson's, or Hippocrates. Remember, in posterior dislocation, the, the head will be right at the margin of the glenoid. It's up and in, and uh, there will be an empty glenoid sign, means the, the glenoid will not be empty and, and will not be having the overlap of the head, and the arm is adapted. It's also called an electric or a light bulb sign. And remember the rotator cuff muscle, supraspinatus capital S, infraspinatus small t, small i, small t, t is minor, and a small s subscapularis. And if there's a tear, you will repair in a young patient. And must know that uh, clavicle is the most common bone to fracture, middle third. And the uh, shoulder is axial nerve, humerus, radial nerve, middle epigonal nerve, radial head, posterior tracheus nerve. In lower limb, remember these around the knee, common peroneal, around the hip shat nerve. This is something very common. So, supracondylar humerus causes cubitus varus. Lateral condylar humerus causes cubitus valgus. The order of nerve involvement is uh, anterior and tortuous, median, radial, and ulnar in the supracondylar humerus fracture. And remember, in lateral condylar humerus fracture, when you have cubitus valgus, as the, the, the elbow will go into valgus, there will be slow onset tardy ulnar nerve pulse. Remember that. And remember the most common elbow dislocated is posterior. Most common nerve involved is ulnar. And it's the most common joint to dislocate in children, whereas the overall most common joint to dislocate is shoulder. Remember, Coley's is an extra articular fracture with posterior displacement. There's a dinner folk deformity, Smith. There is an extra articular fracture with anterior displacement, garden speed deformity. And then you can have an articular fracture like radial stylite, the chauffeur's fracture or Barton's is an intra-articular fracture with a wrist subluxation. Base of first metacarpal, you have a Rolando fracture which is intra-articular or Bennett's with a dislocation. Montagia is a fracture of ulna with dislocated radial head. Willis Gileazi is a fracture of radius with dislocation of the wrist joint. Gamekeeper's thumb is a damage to the ulna collateral ligament of thumb. First metacarpophalangeal joint. Mallet finger, avangel of extensor tendon from distal phalanx splint. Jersey finger, FDP avulsion surgery. When you look at the pelvis, Trendenburg test is for the stability of the hip. And the stability of the hip is dependent upon the joint, is dependent on joint, on gluteus medius, and minimus, and the superior gluteal nerve. So that's how it does. And if uh, you bear the weight on one lobe which is affected, the drop of the pelvis on the opposite side, drop of the pelvis on the opposite side is called as positive. Very, very important test. Thomas test is for hip flexion deformity. Now a, a patient fall and he had shortening of the limb with flexion, adduction, interrotation to hip. When there is fader, you have shortening plus flexion, adduction, interrotation, the most common hip dislocation. And um, this is how it appears. It's adducted and it's shortened. And, but the head is at the level of the joint. The pulsation of the femoral artery is not felt. This is vascular sign of Narath. So the pulsation of femoral artery is not palpable because this is how it goes. And if the head is dislocated, so there will not be the felt, it will not be felt. So vascular sign of Narath is positive, positive in posterior dislocation. Remember that. And a patient has a trauma with Faber. So Faber at lower limbs, flexion, abduction, region is hip and tear dislocation, which is a classical uh, point that one must remember.
right? So going further to the spine, the, the first vertebra I've broken down completely is the Jefferson's fracture, the fracture of the atlas. The second one is hangman C2 over C3. Clay Shovelers fracture is an injury of the lower cervical spine, C7 more than T1. And uh, remember that the Jefferson fracture is not associated with high mortality. C1, C2 is usually a relaxed injury. Corda equina is a damage to the spinal nerve roots at the terminal end. It's an asymmetrical motor and sensory loss. Conus medullaris is a symmetrical motor and sensory loss. Spinal shock is a complete loss after spine injury. And the bulbocavernosal reflex is the first to reappear when the end of spinal shock is there. Jefferson is atlas, hangman is C2 whiplash. If you're going in a high speed vehicle, there's a sudden halt. The neck will go back and come in front. This is a whiplash, hyperextension for a friction. The motorcycle is a hinge fracture. The skull is divided into anterior and posterior parts. Spinal cord injury without obvious neurological injury is seen in pediatric population less than eight years. Cervical and lumbar curvature are normally lordosis. Thoracic is kyphosis. Remember uh, that when I come to lower limb, this, this is an area where the, the, the trabeculae are maintained with the head, the head trabeculae, the acetabulum, and the neck trabeculae. They are in one line. The capsule inserts along the intertrochanteric area. This area is neck of femur. This is intertrochanter. The neck of femur fractures usually have less shortening, less rotation, whereas intertrochanteric fractures has marked shortening and marked rotation. In fact, the lateral part of the foot will touch the bed. This is a fracture neck femur. In young individuals, that is less than 65, fresh fractures fix it with screws. If they've crossed three weeks, you will have to do some additional procedure to make it unite because neck femur is an area which does not unite so easy. And if the patient is 65 or more, you go for a replacement hemiarthroplasty. Intertrochanteric fractures are fixed. And the earlier you fix it, the better it is. You can reduce the mortality of uh, the fracture, the patient, if you fix them within 48 hours. And you usually put a proximal femoral nail or the, the cephalomedullary nail in today's world to, to fix them up. And um, remember that uh, they are known for malunion, whereas neck femur for avian. So, the intertrochanteric fracture is not known for non-union. So wherever there is C, that option is deleted. So your option is C, B, and D. So it's more common in males, and uh, that's how it goes. And when you compare it, uh, this thing, a patient has been running marathon and uh, develops an endometrial aspect of tibia. There is, there is a pain that a patient has. The X-ray is normal, bone scan was ordered. This is shin splint. Stress fracture, marathon runners, very, very common. This is very, very common. This is a fracture of patella. And you usually treat patella and olecranon by tension band wiring. And uh, the four complications that one must remember, C for tight cast is compartment syndrome. M for myositis, there is a history of massage. S for sympathetic overactivity is Sudex. F for femur fracture, 48 hours is fat embolism. So fat embolism, there'll be breathlessness after a femoral fractures. Sudex dystrophy after a Coley's fracture, red hot shiny skin. Myositis ossification after a massage around the elbow. Most commonly involve the brachialis more than biceps. Compartment syndrome will have a stretch pain on extension. Deep posterior compartment of leg is the commonest, and in children, deep flexor compartment of forearm. Remember, intertrochanteric fractures, they malunite. Neck of femur is AVN more than non-union, whereas scaphoid is known for non-union more than AVN. These are two fractures where you must remember non-union AVN the ratio. Hip dislocation, posterior is farther, there will be shortening. Posterior dislocation, the limb shortens. Anterior, they lengthen. Anterior is faber. Shattering nerve palsy is very common in posterior dislocation of hip. Long-term OA is a long-term complication. The lower end of tibia is called the tibial pylon fracture. They have uh, their intraarticular fracture. The talus fracture causes osteoarthritis of the subtalus. That is talocalcaneal joint more than the ankle joint. Avian is next in line. Calcaneum fracture, the bowler's angle, bowler's lowers. Gizane increases. These two angles are very commonly asked in the calcaneal fractures. 
This is a nail for intertroch fractures. This is an example of a proximal humerus fracture classified by the NEARS classification. This is a supra condylar humerus fracture classified by a Gartland's classification. This is Montagia fracture classified by Bedo's classification. This is a Galeazzi fracture. This is a nightstick fracture with the blow of the blow on ulna. This is a Coley's fracture where the distal fragment goes posteriorly. This is a radial styloid intraarticular fracture, very much loved image. Boxer's fracture, very common in boxers. It is a fracture of the neck of fifth metacarp metacarpal. And if you look at this, this is a rail fixator. We will just talk about the types of fixators. This is a rail fixator, which is good to increase the length. Classical management hanging cast is for humerus. Cylinder cast is for petella. Petella tendon bearing cast is for tibia. Hand shaking cast is for coles. Glass holding is for scaphoid. And callous traction, one of the commonest asked images, is for fracture shaft femur less than two years of age. If you look at the bucket handle fracture, it's a fracture on one side of the pelvis, partially opposite side of the pelvis anteriorly. So it's like a buckle, it dwindles like this. In the open book, the anterior structures open and hinges on the posterior elements. That's called as an open book injury. And the melgagne means one side anterior, similar side posterior elements. And when there is both side anterior elements, it's straddle, which is a fracture of the pubic, superior inferior pubic rami. Bumper fracture in the lower limb is a fracture of the upper end of upper end of tibia. And uh, this is the pylon intraarticular fracture of lower end tibia. Cotton's fracture is a fracture of the posterior malus, the lower end of tibia. The medial malus and the lateral malus, all the three malus gone. Pots fracture is a fracture of medial malus and the lateral malus, two malus. Aviator's fracture is a fracture of the body of talus. Chopart's is an injury to the intertarsal area. Liz Frank's is an injury to the tarso metatarsal area. And uh, so this is a Jones fracture, fracture of base, and fracture of the tip of the fifth metatarsal is a pseudo-Jones fracture. March fracture is a fracture of the second and third metatarsal neck. And when you treat a fracture, figure of eight is clavicle. Use lab is for humerus. Hanging cast is for humerus. Dunlop traction or Smith traction is for supracondylar humerus. Hand shaking cast is for coles. Glass holding cast is for scaphoid. Mallet splint for mallet finger. Milwaukee brace is for scoliosis. Cylinder cast is for petella. Petella tendon bearing cast is for tibia. Baller bone splint is of traction of the femur and the tibia. Tension band wiring is used to fix the petla and olecranon. And you have the plates. You have a simple plate to compress the, the, the bones. You have the, the limited contact dynamic compression plate, which has grooves for the vascularity to come in. You have the screws, which are different type. Cancellous bone, the threads are at distance to have a good grip. You have these type of screws coming up into the partially threaded cancellous, or you can have the the screws which has got threads on the head, the locking screws. So these are different types of screws. This is a cortical screw where the threads are more densely packed in cancellous, they are at distance and partially threaded sometimes. And these are the different types of plates. And these are the locking plates where the head has got the screws, the threads, which locks into the threads of the plate. So now the screws cannot come out. If it comes out, the entire plate and the screw system comes out. And then for the long bones of the lower limb, you have the nails. And then if the open injuries where the fracture hematoma communicates with the external environment, you have external fixator. One of them is a rail fixator. We just saw a question. It is out of when you have to increase the length of the limb. And then you have different instruments, osteotome to cut the bone, bone cutter to shave, shovel off good bone grafts. You have bone nibbler, a very commonly shown image to nibble off the bone edges. You have a curate to take out the, the, the material from the cavity. Then you have the bone holding forceps, which are tutr, anything which is tutr will hold the bone. And if it's tutr on one side, plane on other, it's a bone plate holding forceps, bone holding forceps. And when you look at the joints, remember, the DIP and the PIP involvement is characteristic of osteoarthritis. It will always involve the first carbometacarpal joint, OA. OA will spare the metacarpophalangeal joint and the wrist. In osteoarthritis, the medial compartment of the knee is very commonly involved. We saw an x-ray in the beginning, and the treatment is usually the replacement. 
And whereas in the, in the, in the rheumatoid arthritis, it is the MCP and the PIP and the wrist, which is classically involved. But in the late stages, you can have deformities called a swan neck deformity with flexion of DIP and hyperextension of PIP. Or you can have flexion of PIP or hyperextension of DIP, quaternia deformity. In the psoriasis, you can have pencil and cup deformity. Or when I told you, sacroiliac area is very, very pet of the examiner. Ankylosing spondylitis, bamboo spine, thickened spine with thickness in the center of the of the spine where the ligaments are calcified is ankylosing spondylitis, red inflamed great toe is gout where the examination is principally based on the synovial analysis and the crystals being picked up. They are needle shaped, negatively birefringent crystals in gout. Charcot's is a is a neuropathic joint very common in diabetic patients, and they are there is a deformed, a destroyed joint. And the one of the fractures, runner's fractures, is lower and fibula. When you have rickets, it means widening. So it's it's like a cup. The the width is more and the edges are splaying out. It's a ricket. You give calcium vitamin D, you will see a white line. This is called the healing rickets, white line of Frank. Whereas in scurvy, you will have this white line along where there is whitening around the bony epiphysis. It's called as a Wimberger ring sign. So whitening is scurvy. This will ask this neat. And widening is rickets. Remember that. And then some of the x-rays, Ragajasi spine, like a rugby players, seen in chronic renal failure, more than osteopetrosis, bamboo spine, ankylizing spondylitis, cord fish vertebra, is a weakened bone seen in osteoporosis. You saw a skull which has increasing head size. That's how you see the, 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 the thickening of the bone, the, the picture frame vertebra where the margins are thickened or the ivory vertebra. And then you can have a bullet shaped vertebra classically seen in achondroplasia. And this is pages. Very common, important images. Now, this is a patient has got a backache with early morning stiffness, bilateral heel pain, ankylosing spondylitis. Again, this is ankylosing spondylitis. This is something which you, which is showing you the deformity, which is uh, the, the swan neck deformity, so rheumatoid arthritis, and involvement of PIP, DIP, and first CMC, with sparing or risk of MCP is osteoarthritis. You have a classical ulnar deviation of the fingers of RA, and in rheumatoid arthritis, you start with DMARDs, and sometimes you have to give a short course of steroids. The left to right movement and the nodding movement. The first joint in the body is atlanto occipital, and it says yes. The second joint is atlanto axial, which says no. So left to right is a no movement. Painful arc syndrome is when you abduct your shoulder. In the mid abduction, 60 to 120 degrees, you have pain. And this is classically seen in subacromial bursitis or supraspinatus tendonitis. And then you have a young female with morning stiffness with. Uh, with involvement of small joints of hand, answer is rheumatoid arthritis. And when there's a fusion of the multiple vertebras together, it's called as diffuse interskeletal hyperostosis. And more specific for diagnosing is not HLA B27, it's sacroiliitis for ankylosing spondylitis. A female with pain and swelling in thigh, there are lytic lesions in the distal femur with no reaction. There is serous angular fluid with RBCs, which investigation can confirm. This looks like a brown tumor, so you will do a serum, parathyroid hormone. Six-year-old female complains of pain, both the knees, and there's pain going up and down the stairs. X-ray shows bilateral reduced joint space. You have to think about osteoarthritis. Diagnosis of gout, synovial fluid analysis with the crystals. And you remember articular pain with restrict will restrict both active and passive movement. Non-articular pain will only restrict the active movement. Hallux valgus is lateral deviation of the great toe. OA involves the DIP, knee, the medial compartment, hand, the first carpometer, couple joint. OA knee will have genu varum. RA knee will have genu valgum. Then remember, quadriceps is the most commonly affected wasted muscle. If the, there's a limitation of activities of daily living, you'll operate. Less than 60, you do a high table osteotomy, correct the deformity. Beyond that, you replace the joint. RA, DIP spared. MCP is commonest involved. is genu valgum. 
swan neck deformity, bowden ear deformity, ulnar deviation, sacroiliitis in any male or young male with decreased chest expansion. Think about ankylosing spondylitis. There is bamboo spine, dagger sign, trolley track sign. Everything means there is calcification occurring everywhere around the spine. Neuropathic joint or charcoal joints is diabetes, and there is loss of proprioceptive fibers. Gout is great toe, first MTP, needle shaped uric acid crystals, negatively barifringent. Remember, flexion, abduction, extrudation occurs in the infection, synovitis, and tear dislocation. Flexion, adduction, and erosion occurs in hip dislocation and arthritis. And when you look at the satch foot after an amputation, solid ankle and cushion heel is a western foot where you can't sit on the ground, can't squat, whereas Jaipur foot is a natural looking foot by Dr. P.K. Sethi, which can allow you to squat and sit on the ground. Remember, this is a disprolapse. I've shown you an example, classically compressing the nerve roots. And if you look at the, if you look at the lateral or oblique of the spine, you have, a, you have an appearance of a dog in the neck of a dog is an area called as interarticularis. This is a superior articular process. The front leg is the inferior process. The damage to that is spondyl low, means vertebral lysis, seen L5. And when there's a slipping, spondylosis L5, S1. Remember, painful arc syndrome will not occur in complete tears. Which tendons are involvement? If, if, you, if you make a fist and you, you radiate your wrist towards the other side, if there is pain on this area, this is called as Finkelstein's test. And in Finkelstein's test, there is involvement of the first extensor compartment ten tendons, abductor pollicis longus, and extensor pollicis brevis. This is Popeye biceps rupture. Spondylolysthesis L5S1, called as Beardis Scottish Terrier sign. Lysis is break, dog with a call in the neck. Frozen shoulder, all the movements are gone. Treatment is rest plus NSAIDs, if not relieved, local steroids, if not surgery. Painful arc, 60 to 120 degree pain, treatment is plan A. Rest plus NSAIDs, if not relieved, local steroid, if not surgery. Tennis elbow is inflammation of lateral epicondylitis. Golfers is medial epicondylitis. Students elbow is olecranon bursitis. Housemaids knees, pre bursitis. Clergyman's knees, infra bursitis. And then coming to pediatric orthopedics, a good acetabulum and a good epiphysis should be inside. Shallow acetabulum, small epiphysis, DDH. Investigation of choice is MRI, and you need to get it back. This is pavlic harness, a spot diagnosis. Avascular necrosis of femoral epiphysis at the age of four to eight is perthes. All these movements where hip is involved is limitation of abduction and rotation. And uh, if you have slipping of the epiphysis in relation to the metaphysis, actually the epiphysis does not move, the metaphysis moves up. This is called a slipped capital femoral epiphysis. If you draw a line over the neck of femur, it should cut a part of the epiphysis. If it does not, it means it's a clean line or Tethoven sign. When you have pseudo hypertrophy of the calf, it's seen in Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. The largest gene is dystrophin. A patient has a proximal muscle weakness. He will climb on his own body called the Garver sign. And when you have a short neck because of the loss of segmentation of cervical spine with low posterior hairline with decreased movements. It's called the clipple field syndrome, which is a spot diagnosis. Congenital talipers equinovirus is a deformity and deformity in talonavicular areas. There is small medial border, large lateral border. There is four components. Avus means increased plantar arch, adduction, medial deviation, varus, the tilt is interior, equinus. And when you correct, this is the order in which you correct. Green stick injury is break in only one cortex. And this is congenital to pseudoarthrosis of tibia, anterolateral deformity, made lung deformity. The distal radius is got a deficiency in the palmar and ulnar aspect. So the lower and ulnar becomes prominent. And this is a fusion of the radial joint, which will not allow the, the, the pronation supination to occur. And also remember one thing, the lateral deviation of the spine is scoliosis measured by an angle called a Cobb's angle. And uh, do you usually have scoliosis in the lower 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 dose in the lumbar spine? This is Cobb's angle. A small child was held by a maid where she gave attraction to the elbow and the arm was pronated. This is a classical case of a pulled elbow. A patient has congenital scoliosis. How will you evaluate the, the, the scoliosis, which is postural? If you bend forward, it will disappear. A scoliosis, which is congenital, means deformity, will not disappear. So forward bending is the test for that. 
And uh, with respect to CTV, remember, Aquinas should be corrected last. Ponsetti, correction up to 90%. Four foot is erected. 50% is males and bilateral is correct. So there is a deformity here, which is structural, so congenital. And remember, this is radio ulnar synostosis. So you will not have pronation, supination. This is a brace, which is used for DDA, the pavlic harness. This is Klippel field syndrome, a spot diagnosis. Cobb's angle is for scoriosis, kites or CTAV, Bowman's for supracondylar humerus. Remember, Dennis Brown splint is for CTAV. Agnes Hunt is for flexion deformity. Russell's is for intertrochantric. Pavlik harness, I just showed you the images for DDH. Milwaukee or Boston basis for scoliosis. Brand's triangle is measured for the supratrochantric. Pages is an osteoclast defect. P for pages, P for pelvis, P for pages, P for pain. Ivory vertebra and cotton wool skull are there. And osteopetrosis, again, an osteoclast defect, regurgitus spine, and marble bone disease is the name. Osteogenesis imperfecta is collagen 1 defect. Painless limp is perthes, 4 to 8 years. It's an avascular necrosis of femoral epiphysis. SCFE slipped the capital femoral epiphysis 11 to 20 years. Abduction and duration deformity in CTV is club foot, and Pirani score is done for it. Remember that you are going to give a petal tendon bearing cast when, when you have a soft callus form. This is what it means is deformable. Remember that in sports injury, best results after meniscal repair is seen in the red zone. If you look at a meniscus, it is the peripheral one third, which has got the blood supply. And that's why the repair is there where there's blood. All are seen in ACL tear, except you will have uh, anterior dislocation of tibia, yes. Seagorn fracture is yes. Deep, deep fossa is correct. High tibial slope is not there. And football player with knee injury, medial collateral injury, which touches most of this type of injury. So when there is an MCL injury, so in the MCL injury, you have the ACL injury and then you have the medial meniscus. So MCL, ACL, medial meniscus. So in the MCL injuries, you, you usually will have an associated ACL injury and the meniscus injury, these two. So medial meniscus is more damaged than lateral meniscus. And uh, ACL will occur in a valgus force, reflection, rotation. And uh, remember, it prevents the hyperextension. And these are tests, Latchman, anterior drawer, pivot shift, and dailies. These are the tests for ACL. PCL prevents external rotation. Dial test is for postural corner. They just love to ask you this. Most common tendon injured is supraspinatus. Then the biceps, then tendoechilis. Most of us will remember tendoechilis is the commonest. Most common ligament damage in the body is anterior talofibular ligament. Remember, friends, a postmenopausal woman with a history of coles is complaining of backache. Which of the following is false? Teriparatide should be started before supplementing with phosphonates can be done. Bisphosphonates are not given for more than one year is wrong. They can be given up to up to five years. Calcium requirement is this correct. Vitamin D is given is correct. This is a classical case of scurvy, whitening. This is a classical case of osteoporosis. Test not commonly used in osteoporosis. So DEXA scan is done. Quantitative CT is done. Chemical analysis is done. X-ray is done. So answer is ACDE. Child with, with uh, the widening of the bone is rickets. And if you have a patient with normal serum ALP, normal PTH. So it can't be hyperparathyroidism. Normal ALP cannot be osteomalacia. Increased calcium cannot be osteoporosis. So the answer is vitamin D toxicity. And rickets, there's widening, scurvy, there's whitening. And Wimberger ring sign, there's sclerosis of the epiphyseal end. Hyperparathyroidism, there is hollow bones, brown tumor, salt pepper skull. Ruggers, the spine is CRF more than osteopetrosis. Osteoporosis, DEXA scan is less than minus 2.5. Cord fish vertebra, we saw different images. And remember, in cord fish vertebra, osteoporosis is more common than osteomalacia. In more than 65 years, you do a, the screening in females and more than 17 males. Collar's disease, uh, coholars, is navicular. So there is tarsal bone involvement. ABN of the femoral head occurs due to the damage of the medial circumflex femoral artery. 